There we go. Yep. Okay, so um, it's been really fun to be here. I've understood some of what you all were talking about throughout this uh, conference, but um, I, I am not a developer. I don't work in the software world very much at all, at, at all really, but I find myself more and more being, um, needing to understand some things and, um, and also realizing that, that having a conversation between uh, what I do as a clinical psychologist and what people in the tech world are doing um, could, uh, could really uh, help us in a lot of ways uh, reach people we're trying to reach with effective treatments. So mental health disorders um, are not uncommon at all. Um, these days, uh, it's about one in four to one in five people are affected by some sort of depression, anxiety, insomnia, substance abuse, a psychotic disorder, bipolar disorder. It's, you know, it's, it, it's, there are probably people you know, maybe people you're close to, um, who experience problems like this. So it's, you know, it's, it's not at all uncommon and, you know, but it's an interesting problem that we still have in society that, you know, if someone has heart disease or if someone has cancer, you know, there's, there's not a lot of value judgment around that. We, we try to rally. We want to help people. We might not always know what to say. But with mental health issues, there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of stigma. People don't know how to talk about it. They, that means they don't know how to ask for help always. So um, although, you know, this is something that one in four to one in five people experience, um, and the World Health Organization actually has um, depression listed as one of the top causes of the disability in the world. Um, few people actually, fewer than half of the people out there who have some sort of diagnosable disorder actually receive any care at all, and even fewer receive adequate care. The modal number of therapy sessions that people attend is one. So basically they show up, they talk to the therapist a little bit, and they never go back. And that's probably for a lot of reasons. First of all, people don't always realize that something's wrong, right? Sometimes people are just, this is how I've always been, right? I've always had trouble sleeping. I've always, you know, I've always been kind of depressed or, you know, what do you mean this, is, this anxiety is clinical? This is, this is what I do. I'm an anxious person, right? Um, and, and sometimes when it starts to affect people's day-to-day -day lives, their relationships, their work, you know, it might be time to, to get some help. There's also stigma, though, in, in letting people know that, um, that maybe you feel like you need some help. Um, people often don't want to let their employers know. They don't want to let their neighbors or friends know. A lot of this stuff stays very, very quiet. Um, and then um, once people decide, all right, I need to go get some help, um, access is a huge problem. Um, after some of the recent shootings where mental health was possibly implicated, actually, people with mental health problems are more likely to be the targets of violence than to perpetrate violence. I want to make that very clear. But this was a cartoon that was out there that it's actually easier to get a gun than it is to get mental health treatment. And that's for a number of reasons. Um, one is insurance. There have been mental health parity laws Past that say that insurance companies have to treat mental health treatment the same way they treat, you know, physical health problems. Um, but that's not really happening in practice. The co-pays are often higher. Um, also, uh, there are a limited number of therapists who take different types of insurance. Um, so it's really kind of a labyrinth, labyrinth trying to find somebody who does. And actually, a lot of people don't take insurance at all because it doesn't. Um, it, it actually doesn't really reimburse them at a. a high enough rate to you know keep their lights on so a lot of people do self-pay um, and then they'll give you a receipt and you can file it with your insurance company which means you know there's a lot of paperwork so it's very very difficult to navigate um, so you know if we look at this as kind of a funnel there are you know a fair number of people who want or need help fewer of them seek help fewer of them find affordable care or someone who takes their insurance um, Let's say they find somebody who takes their insurance. They've got to find, you know, maybe one or two therapists in their area take their insurance. They might have wait lists. They might have, you know, the only slot they've got available is, you know, 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning when you're supposed to be at work, which means you've got to go and talk to your employer and say, hey, can I, you know, have 9 
to 11, 9 to 10.30 off every Tuesday. Um, that can be a real problem for people. Um, and then there's also, um, there in the past, say, 30 years or so, um, there have been huge strides in the treatments of a number of problems like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, there's an intervention that can cut the re-attempt rate for suicide in half. There are, you know, there are, are, are treatments that can um, get about 70% of the people that get, you know, that do the treatments and complete the treatments, uh, people with PTSD can actually lose their PTSD diagnosis. Um, there are, you know, there are treatments that can get rid, help people get rid of their panic attacks or reduce them dramatically and help them handle them when they do have them in like 10 or 12 sessions. So we've come a really long way, but not every therapist out there has been trained in them or provides them. And there are a lot of reasons for that. So these treatments um, are called evidence-based treatments. Many of them are cognitive behavioral therapies, which some of you might have heard about. Um, some of them lean more towards cognitive, kind of helping people take a, a, a good close look at the way that they're you know, viewing what's going on around them or, or how they're interacting with the world, um, or more behavioral, where you have people kind of do a, a series of, of things to help them you know, uh, reduce the anxiety or um, you know, reduce their depression. Um, the goal, though, of, of cognitive behavioral therapies is for the psychologist to put themselves out of business. So these are short-term treatments. The idea is to help people get the tools that they need um, to cope with and um, and kind of work with their own, you know, their own problems, um, so that they experience a reduction in symptoms while they're in treatment, and then they can kind of keep doing these things on their own um, that they've learned during treatment after, you know, after, you know, a couple months. Um, so nobody lays on a couch. It's a very collaborative process, and one of the key features of the more cognitive treatments is, is uh, the Socratic dialogue. Um, the idea is that the wisdom uh, resides within each of us, and the therapist's job is to help ask a series of questions so that people can kind of find the answers um, to maybe look at the, the problem in a different way. So for example, in post-traumatic st stress disorder, one of the big things that we see happen over and over and over again, no matter what the traumatic circumstance was, is a lot of sort of self-blame or I should have done something differently. I shouldn't have, I knew I had a gut feeling that day. I shouldn't have left the house. Um, you know, I knew I shouldn't have taken that, that road. I knew I shouldn't have, you know, had that much to drink at the bar. On and on and on. We see these types of things over and over again. And one of the most effective ways to deal with that um, is through Socratic questioning and helping people you know, really take a couple steps back and check some of their assumptions about, about these things. Very often, they made perfectly good decisions in the context that they were in. They made the best decision they could at the time, and maybe there was nothing they could have done differently. So we have to use Socratic questioning to help people get at that. Um, I mention that because learning how to Socratic question is challenging sometimes for therapists. And to, to really get the questions very personalized is, is not, it's not an easy algorithm, right? So there are certain types of questions you can ask, but sometimes for things like PTSD, you really have to get in there and ask very specific questions about the circumstances. And you know, so there are a lot of things that we might be able to do using technology, um, but it would be great to figure out how to help therapists do, you know, do a, a better job Socratic questioning and to help people be able to do some of that with themselves. Um, so evidence-based treatments are out there. Um, we've made great strides. People keep trying to improve these treatments and figure out what's going to work best for whom and how to improve the treatments we have, but there are a lot of effective treatments out there. Um, but there are big challenges in getting these treatments out to the people who need them. So researchers, um, you know, a lot of people who develop and test treatments are researchers. They, you know, they do some studies. It shows that the, the treatment works. But then they have these academic jobs where they're supposed to be writing papers and they're supposed to be, you know, teaching grad students. And so they teach their own students how to do this treatment, but they don't really have time to do any kind of broad dissemination. Maybe they give a few workshops or something. But what we've learned, not surprisingly, is that you can't learn to do a therapy effectively in a two-day workshop. You know, it, it takes consultation, usually several months of consultation. 
um, with active cases for people to really get comfortable. Um, probably they need to do four or five, six cases before they'll feel like, okay, now I've really got this, I'm comfortable with it, I've seen it work with enough different people that I can you know, feel like I can generalize my skills. So that's a big demand on the one person out there who knows how to do this treatment's time, right? You know, so they've trained a couple other postdocs, they do this in the, um, in the, the trials, but then they've got to get it out there, right? So how do we do this? Um, you know, there's, there are big gaps in, in the value change that, chain that moves research products to effective, you know, from the lab out to consumers. Um, these are some of the ways that people try to do it, maybe give a workshop for continuing education, you know, put a book out there, um, some people actually have moved towards more of a business model where they, you know, they have a, a you know, an institute where people can get trained. Um, but still, it's a pretty limited number of therapists who can take the time off of their own. You know, a lot of therapists who work in private practice, they go to a workshop, they're losing billable hours. So, you know, it's a big investment to learn these things. Um, and there are lots of them out there because the way that the, the research incentives worked is, you know, you train somebody to, or you, you develop a treatment for depression and you manualize it so that in the studies that you do, you can say for sure that people are getting this treatment that you developed and that the therapists aren't doing something else. And then, but then there's got to be one for PTSD and one for anxiety, and so we're asking therapists to learn all of these things. Now, what's actually the case is there are a lot of underlying general principles in treating all of these things so you don't really have to learn one manual after another there are some there are some key principles but you do have to pay attention to dose so there's you know a fair amount to think about as a therapist but there are these kind of gaps in the pipeline so that consumers don't um don't get the treatment they need very often um so for example you know this this has really real consequences um, on average, people with a diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder, which can be very, very debilitating for people, um, see three or four doctors and spend over nine years seeking treatment before they even get a correct diagnosis. And then to find somebody who can provide um, you know, the, the right kind of mix of exposure therapy, which is one of the most effective things to help uh, OCD. And also, uh, they found that SSRIs uh, in combination tends to work better. So finding somebody who knows how to do that um, can really result in you know, years and years of missed opportunities in people's lives um, when what they have is completely treatable. So more and more, we're getting interested in what are the alternatives or enhancements to face-to-face -face treatment so that if you live in a small town and you know there are only a couple of therapists out there and maybe they don't have the treatment, they don't know the treatment for PTSD or panic um, or whatever it might be, um, that you can still get something. Um, so web-based interventions have, have filled um, some of the gap. They've made treatment more efficient um, in, in mental health systems. There's a pretty good one out there. There are actually a couple of pretty good ones out there for insomnia. Um, just to back up for a second, I, uh, I, haven't, I don't work with a lot of these products myself. I, I you know, looked at them, I've evaluated some of them, um, but I'm not affiliated with, uh, with really any of the organizations I'm gonna talk about. Um, this one, Beating the Blues, there's a UK version and a US version, and a lot of insurance companies will pay for you to do this if you're depressed. Um, in the National Health Service, where they've implemented cognitive therapy, they're one of the systems that's actually implemented, uh, implemented evidence-based treatments. Um, they, if, you, if your depression is below a certain cutoff, they will have you try this first, and it works for about seven out of 10 people that get through the program. And then they do face-to-face -face treatment with people it doesn't work for. Um, Australia is developing one called Mood Gym. Um, so these are, these are treatments that people can get themselves. Um, if they can't, you know, if they can't clear a wait list, if they can't make it in when the therapists are, um, you know, when, when their therapists are available. Um, if there are no therapists that do cognitive therapy for depression, for example, and that's what they want. There are other ways that we're using technology to enhance treatment. Um, so this is at University of Washington. This group is using virtual reality for uh, burn victims so that um, it, it can kind of help them manage their pain and distract. Um, they're using this, this frozen world for kids when they get their, um, their wounds, their bandages changed because that's, that's especially painful when you're uh, a burn victim. And so using this apparently helps kids um, experience less pain. Um, and then also, 
virtual reality for, uh, for phobias and for anxiety can be very useful for therapists because, I know, I should have, should have warned you guys, like, um, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so what I want you to do is start some, you know, diaphragmatic breathing, and, no, but, you know, as a therapist, <laughs> um, if, if someone needs exposure, let's say they've got a fear of flying, they've got a fear of heights, they've got a fear of social situations or public speaking, and I've got an hour or less to spend with them, and in that hour I'm also supposed to write their clinical note, et cetera. I, you know, I'm not going to be able to necessarily go across town with them to the really tall building and have them look out the window on the second floor and then the fifth floor and then the, you know, and kind of step them up to the top floor, right? Um, but if I can use something like this in my office, that's fantastic. I can do exposure <laughs> therapy with them without having to figure out a way to bill for an hour and a half or two hours at a setting, which does not work in the way that you know, people have to bill when they're doing therapy. So, so these are some great things to enhance treatment and to get treatment to people who need them. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, some of the limitations and um, some of the challenges with things like this in a few minutes. But there are also some other really interesting ways that people are starting to try to get treatment out there. So one is by text. How many of you, like, write psychotherapy laying on a couch? Nope. Now you can do it by text. Um, so crisis intervention, you know, a lot of the, the returning veterans from the, the, the recent conflicts and, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan um, use their phones. They're much more comfortable, and, and teenagers too, they're much more comfortable texting than they would be calling up a hotline. So the, the crisis hotline um, now has a text option, um, and it's been used pretty effectively. There are also a couple of companies. Um, this is one that I am collaborating with. They want to see if they can do evidence-based treatment for PTSD over text. Um, uh, that's an empirical question. I'm, I'm very interested to see what we find out. Um, but you can text with a therapist. And rather than going once a week to see your therapist, you can text. The, they check in at least twice a day. So you can, it's not, it's asynchronous. Um, but you can get text from your therapist. You can text with your therapist. Um, any time of day, which, which might make this much more accessible for some people. And um, so I'm, I'm interested to see the data on how well this works. They're, you know, one nice thing about this company is they are doing program evaluation um, and they're tracking people's symptoms. So, you know, well, and they, they say they're getting some pretty good outcomes. There are also um, ways that technology has been using for support. So there's, a, there's a, um, a site called Big White Wall. They also have an app. Um, and this is just, this is a uh, community um, that supports one another, um, people with mental health problems, and they've got some trained um, kind of facilitators to make sure that, you know, there's no trolling and that people are really getting the help they need. And if, you know, if somebody really needs crisis intervention, there are people on there that kind of keep an eye. But it's largely a community, um, which I think is, is really what a lot of people appreciate. You know, some people, it might get them the whole way. Other people might need you know, some sort of a therapist as well. But, you know, there are these nice communities that are springing up to support each other. And then there are also ways for um, people to kind of get access to the different resources that are available. So there's a, a site called After Deployment. And when people come home from Iraq and Afghanistan, reintegration is, is a big, big challenge. And so, you know, there are sites that have, will link people to all the resources and apps and things for, you know, whether it's anger, depression, um, drug use, PTSD, um, so the, you know, there, there are um, sites and there are programs that are trying to link people with resources that they need. And then also, I'm told we shouldn't call these avatars, although for some reason we do, we're supposed to call them bots or something, um, but, um, but there, so there is a discharge nurse um, in cardiac care that is one of these, her name is Nurse Louise, and um, there's a study that showed that um, people felt cared about, people missed her when they stopped interacting with her, and she did things like, you know, ask them what kinds of problems they were having, talk to them about how to change their, you know, the, the dressing on their wounds, et cetera. And it apparently worked pretty well because often in, in these settings, you know, the discharge nurses are pretty busy, and so they kind of say, here's your handout, and here's your, you know, and, and Nurse Louise was apparently a, um, an improvement. So now people are trying to develop that uh, mm -hmm. for, things like assessing and helping people when they're in a suicidal crisis. And this is a, a, a man, who, a Dr. David Jobes, who developed a, a treatment, a really nice um, intervention that can be used with people who are feeling suicidal. 
And so basically they're trying to turn him, you know, and, and take what he does and, and kind of automate it um, as something that people can access whenever they feel like they need it. And, and they're doing some research around this. Um, one interesting thing that I guess they found out is that, um, uh, that <laughs> apparently older white men are most effective to get people to pay attention to facts, but younger, kind of hipper, um, you know, bots, avatars, um, who uh, match the target demographics are, uh, get better behavior change. Um, but people are starting to do things with facial recognition using the camera function and coding emotions so that the avatar can match emotions. Um, so I think this is going to be very interesting. And, you know, again, there's a part of me that's like, really, you can do this with a computer? Like, can you really? You know, but, but this is where, you know, this is where we'll, uh, we'll see, right? I mean, the, there's research going on around a lot of this. And then there are a lot of apps out there that are being developed. And I work at the National Center for PTSD, which is funded by the VA. Um, I actually had to take the day off because uh, the idea of being sent to a conference where there was beer is just, you know, your taxpayer dollars are not being spent on that kind of thing. Um, but I do, I do want to brag about some of the great work that some of my colleagues, I don't do this work, but some of my colleagues there, um, the mobile apps team is, is doing some really great stuff. So there's a, an app called PTSD Coach. There's one for families. Um, there's one for concussions because traumatic brain injury is, is uh, very common in the military. Uh, there's one for mindfulness. Uh, there's a mood coach. Um, there are parenting apps. There's one for substance abuse. And these are all basically self-management apps. There are also apps to support the, the treatments that we're doing for depression and for PTSD, where um, one of the things that I, that I when I mentioned that we want to kind of help people become their own therapists and put ourselves out of business, we give people things to practice between sessions so that therapy can happen all week long. And these, there are apps that, that really help people do that. They can walk through the processes that they need to do to challenge thoughts and feelings that they're, you know, challenge the thoughts that they're having about a particular situation or, um, you know, work on breathing retraining to relax and things. And, and these apps help people do that during the week. Um, but PTSD Coach is intended to be standalone and can help people, um, you know, manage their PTSD symptoms. Um, there's self-assessment so people can kind of track how their symptoms are going. Um, and then they can manage symptoms. They can favorite some of these uh, different strategies. And um, so they'll show up more often, um, you know, when they experience a certain type of problem, the different skills and tools that they could use. Um, you know, pop up and the ones that seem to work for them will pop up more frequently or they can program it, you know, to, to pop up. Um, they're also uh, using apps like this for, to um, supplement uh, DBT, which is a therapy uh, for people with what has been called, is often called borderline personality disorder, but this is, a, um, this is one of the uh, places where self-harm shows up often and so there are tools to help people um, when they're starting to feel like that's something they want to do, there are tools to help people, um, you know, find other fund alternatives and use healthier coping skills. So there are also, there's wearable technology. Some of you guys have probably seen this, you know, when you go jogging, when you wear your watch or whatever. There's a company called Fundaware um, that has, uh, you know, very wearable, these patches, uh, wearable technology. So here's one of these places where, you know, one of my assumptions as a psychologist, I was talking with a company, not fun to wear, but another company that, um, that makes some wearables. And I was like, so we've got these apps. You guys can just take your thing, right? And you can look at our skin conductance or heart rate or something. And you can, you can link up to the app. And then the app could say something like, um, hey, you seem anxious right now. Um, do you want to use a skill? And then direct people to the skills. And they were like, yeah, we could probably do that. But I was like, you can do this like today, right? I mean, you can just type, write some of your code and it'll all just happen. And I guess that's a pretty big project. But when we get to that point, <laughs> um, when we get to that point, it's going to be really amazing, right? Because people will start to have, you know, it's, it looks like they, you know, data that they're generating will direct them towards skills. That are, and, and over time, we can get better at honing in on what skills help when they're, you know, when they have certain physical um, experiences, for example. And this kind of ties into this movement called the quantified self. There's a, a community that is 
um, using technologies like this for people to develop um, insights into their own you know, health and behavior um, using these communities. And um, so this is uh, my colleague, Kelly Kerner, a collaborator of mine who was gonna present with me today and is doing really cool stuff, is the person who told me about this movement and you know, the, the potential for people to kind of start making discoveries more from the bottom up. Um, rather than us, you know, researchers coming in and getting a big grant and collecting a bunch of data. So do these things work? Um, there was an interesting article in The Atlantic just recently where somebody tried to use some different kind of self-help apps. Um, and the answer is we don't really know. Um, you know, we, we haven't, there have been some feasibility studies, there have been small studies. Um, we know a little bit more about the web-based, um, the web-based treatments. They do work, but getting people to stick with them is really a, a, an issue. Um, so, so they work when people stick with them. Um, but just like psychotherapy, having people stick with them is a problem. Part of why we don't know that this stuff, whether this stuff works very well is because this is what it's like to get a grant. This is my life. You can ask my husband um, how much time I spend talking over kind of in, in this part of the picture, right? Trying to get a grant. Um, you write a grant, you get reviews, you have to rewrite it. You get more reviews. If you're lucky, you get funded. Then you do the research, and then you disseminate the results. And the gap between research and practice is 17 to 25 years. And that's across medicine. So it took 25 years to get people to wear gloves when they did surgery. Um, it's taken, it's taken really, um, it's taken, you know, hand hygiene is a whole area of implementation research. How do we get doctors and nurses to wash their hands? So I'm like, what am I doing trying to get people to Socratic question and like do exposure because we can't even get people to wash their hands. So that brings me to how we're trying to use technology to support therapists. Um, so we have everything from toolkits that providers can use. This is if you're a community provider and you need some guidance and help on treating veterans who show up um, to see you. Um, but we're also developing communities around consultation and trying to get people tools. Um, so this is this is, you know, me um, and, and my research assistants kind of developing using this platform um, to uh, develop, to develop and work with communities. They have different meetings. Um, and then we have these resources for them um, that they can drill into. Like, you know, if I want to do cognitive processing therapy, um, you know, here's the manual, here are the worksheets, here are some, you know, here are different webinars to provide guidance. You know, it's a little clunky, but it, you know, it, it, they're, they're useful tools. But then my, my, my friend Kelly, um, is uh, doing all kinds of great stuff to really make this more user friendly and to get it, you know, get people what they need to do this stuff. So, you know, she's really embraced this idea of user centered design. Um, and this is where I think, you know, developers and psychologists need to really partner because it's got to be slick and user friendly and something that people want to use so they don't just, you know, get on the website once or twice and it's kind of clunky and there's content heavy and they got to read through all this stuff. Um, the content has to be there, um, but it also has to be user friendly. And so, you know, they're, they're working through these cycles. Um, so, for example, here are the types of requirements that they're looking at. If, if a therapist um, is seeing someone who's suicidal, they're going to be anxious about doing the right thing. They need to know how to assess suicide risk. Um, maybe they haven't been trained in that in 30 years, right? And there, there's new guidance on what, um, how to assess risk. Um, maybe they can't find the guidelines quickly. So they need cheat sheets. They need training and risk assessment. They need bite-sized resources that increase their motivation and sense of efficacy. And so they're, they're, you know, they're building this stuff in and they're, they're testing it at every point. Like, okay, have we got this? Do you have what you need? And so Kelly has turned this into a uh, platform to help therapists who want to do evidence-based treatments but maybe can't go to a bunch of workshops and get consultation into this community. So. Um, so they've got ways to create treatment plans, to track progress. Um, there's actually ways to do computer-assisted therapy and do documentation in real time so you can spend more of your time in session with people instead of having to allow time to do clinical notes. Um, so for example, this is, this is what you might get if you've got somebody and you need to create a hierarchy of activities. Let's say you've got somebody who's depressed and they're not getting out of the house and you want to get them like, you know, kind of baby stepping towards being more active. Or let's say that you've got somebody who's anxious and you want them to gradually get to a point where they're doing things that make them anxious. So there, you know, it'll walk you through the steps. There's a video that you can watch and you can watch it with your, you know, with your client. Um, so, you know, here's what this is about. Here's what we're going to do now. And this allows the therapist to walk in, even if they don't feel 100% equipped to do this, they've got some tools that they can use. 
They can build agendas. What do we need to make sure we do in this session to get people where we want them to be? And then this turns into their clinical note where they can just you know, add a little bit more information. Um, there are tip sheets on how to do these things, what to do, um, guidance towards videos. And then they're tracking their, uh, their client's symptoms. So they're really seeing like, okay, how's their depression? How's their anxiety? Oh, look, it dropped. What did we do last week that worked? Um, and we often think of research as kind of this cold clinical enterprise, right? But when, you're, when you've got therapists and communities of people that are, are willing, you know, able to do this from the ground up, where people are tracking, and, and most therapists are not tracking people's symptoms or functioning in a systematic way from week to week. It's just not something that was kind of a part of, Freud didn't talk about that, you know, that's, that's not really what people tend to do, but when you do this, you can kind of take the spirit of community and people, you know, people tracking how are my patients doing and what am I, what am I doing that's helping them? And you know, together you can kind of create, you can, you can create this bottom-up participatory research mindset um, where you're collecting data to provide a fundamental basis to make clinical decisions instead of kind of relying on, you know, flying by the seat of your pants. Um, and you've got a community around you as you do this. Now, there are one final thing I want to say is that, you know, I think in, in the area of, you know, like using tracking, right, how we're doing our fitness, you know, our diets and things, people are maybe pretty open with sharing their data. They don't really care what happens. Like they buy an app and maybe somebody's going to do something with their data or sell it. And you know, people don't really care that much, right? Mental health, you know, sometimes people care. Some people don't. Some people would say, absolutely use my data because we can figure out how to help people get better. Go for it. I want to be a part of this. Other people are not going to feel that way. So we have to come up with ways. And I think that part of this is, you know, true informed consent where people understand how are we going to use the data that we collect. Um, and it, it probably needs to be rolling informed consent. You know, it, it, it probably, it should be, you know, hey, this person, you know, wants to do a study of whether or not, you know, assigning between session practice for this particular problem results in better outcomes. Will you let us use your data for that? Rather than like, hey, we want to use your data to do all kinds of research. And remember when Facebook got into trouble because there was something about how maybe they'd do some research <coughs> with it and then they did, did that study to manipulate people's emotions and, you know, that got published and people had no idea that there was research being done. Um, that's what we don't want because people, you know, we want people to trust this technology, we want people to trust their providers, and we don't want people to have an experience that turns them away from getting the help that they need. We want people to get effective treatments, the adequate doses so that if they say, you know what, I tried CBT for depression and it didn't work for me, we know that they got an adequate dose. And then we can say, well, that's okay because there are like six other treatments for depression that could help you. Um, but to do that, we've got to be able to collect data, see what's working, see what, if that, how that corresponds with what actually happened in session and if people kind of got the doses they needed. So we can do wonderful research from the bottom up when we develop platforms like this. We just need to, need to make sure that everybody knows what they're signing up for when they participate in this and that they're, they're okay with this. And especially when monetization is involved. When, you know, when, I mean, this stuff is not cheap, it's not free. Um, and you know, people need to understand if, if their data are going to be used to make money for the business rather than just research as well. Um, so you know, think about informed consent. I think when when you know when these things are being developed. And um, so that's what I have. And um, thank you all for really a wonderful conference. Yeah.